285, leaning on the everlasting arms. 285.
the principles around rightly dividing and how to rightly divide. Turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 
Verse 15 has been our launch verse. Let's write again. Oh, yeah. All right. So this time, though, this is I'm going to go ahead and end it with this service here. This will be the end of this series, and then we'll move on to um, other topics. I mean, we're going to we're going to be doing the financial thing during the Sunday school hour for a little while, probably. And then um, and then we'll get back to some other topics. We'll talk about probably like creation and that sort of thing and, and um, a little bit of that stuff. But anyhow, so um, so we've been we've been going through this uh, God's method for dividing the to, for studying the Bible, and that is to rightly divide. And the, the scripture on that is Second Timothy, chapter two and verse 15. Uh, probably by the end of all this, you have this verse memorized. So praise the and Lord. Show thyself approved unto God. <laughs> there we go. Amen. Pretty solid right there. All right. Yep. Yeah. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's how we're supposed to study. The, we're supposed to study the Bible, number one, right? Study to show thyself approved. And. Um, you know, what I think about with that verse is, is uh, there's a, we talked about, you know, at the second advent, there's going to be a big battle, right? And we're going to follow the Lord on white horses. We covered all that, right? After the white, th after the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to get robe, we're going to get the white robes. And then, and because we're, and, and, um, and there's going to be a wedding in heaven. And then we're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ back down to earth at the second advent. And there's that Armageddon. And uh, if you read Malachi chapter three, I think it's chapter 3. It sure sounds like we're going to be in the fight. And so we better get ready to use our sword. So we got to study. we got to study now while there's time. Uh, we have to study and be ready to fight, right? Because we're soldiers. Okay. Anyhow, so it says, Study to show self approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So it tells you how to study the Bible, and that is rightly dividing. And we looked at all sorts of different topics uh, I wrote down some of these things here. Um, we looked at, compared the Old and the New Testaments. We looked at the Advents. We looked at the Raptures, because there's multiple Raptures in Scripture. Uh, we looked at the Resurrections, and now we've been covering the Judgments. And at all these different points, and this is just from the cross onward in this case, I decided not to redraw the whole thing, because it, it's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, looking through Scripture, there's these key decision points, and these Judgments seem to match up to major changes in the order of things. Right, and so, like for instance, um, God establishes a the pre the uh, the uh, establishes a covenant, the Edenic covenant with Abraham. He says, "Don't eat. Of, you can eat of any of the fruit of the tree, but that one tree, don't eat of the fruit of that tree." And of course, they ate of the fruit of that tree, and that sin caused um, caused God to have to kick them out of the Garden of Eden, and then there was a judgment on sin. God cursed, I'm sorry, a judgment on man. God cursed mankind yeah. because they had sinned, right? right. And, then, uh, and then man goes on a little while, and the wickedness in, uh, uh, increases, and so that so badly that nothing, the thoughts of man is, is only evil continually. And so then God says, man, i got to flood the earth because man has gotten so wicked. And so in Genesis chapter 6, God calls out Noah and says, hey, I'm going to flood the earth, and, uh, and, and then I'm going to use you to restart. Right? And so he floods the earth, and in Genesis chapter 9, he establishes a new covenant with Noah, the Noahic covenant. And then... And then uh, things go on for a little bit there, and you get to Genesis chapter 11, and he had told man to spread, to scatter, and replenish the earth, and they decided not to. They decided and said they were going to build a tower to reach up to heaven, and so God's like, i got to do something about this. And this, then you have another judgment. Uh, the, the flood was a judgment, by the way. I didn't mention right. that. Um, but <laughs> and then the, what, the covenant God made with Adam after his fall, that was another covenant, too. Um, <laughs> Uh, so then in Genesis chapter 11, God scatters mankind. We have another judgment on man. Uh, and then in Genesis chapter 12, he calls out Abraham. And with Abraham, he establishes a covenant. And he says that he's going to bless all nations through his seed. He's going to raise up a nation, Israel, through his seed. He's going to be the father of many nations, all those different things. He promises him, him the land. And he says, in Jacob shall thy seed be called. And he says that that land is going to be given to the seed through Jacob, right? And that seed is pointing to Jesus Christ is going to be used to bless all the families of the earth and all the nations of the earth. 
so then, um, so Genesis 12 and 17 and 21 um, <clears throat> has all the details of that stuff. Uh, and so then, then you get into, um, uh, there's the famine in the land that caused Israel to move in there um, into Egypt. And then not too long after that, we get into Exodus, and now suddenly Egypt is oppressing Israel, God's chosen people. And God is still going to make good on his covenant and give them the promised land. And so, so Israel is in bondage to Egypt, and so God judges Egypt, and you got the ten plagues. And then, um, and then God calls those people out. He delivers them through Moses, and then he establishes a covenant in Exodus chapter 19 through like 23, I believe. Uh, he establishes the covenant that is the law, the old covenant. And then, and then from there, things go on, and, and of course, you know, Israel gets all pharisaical, and, you know, like in Isaiah, it talks about how he's not pleased with their offerings, and, and um, they rejected God, the Father, in the Old Testament from being king, right? And then, and then so then God sends Jesus Christ to, um, God sends Jesus Christ down to pay for the sins of all mankind, and Israel rejects God the Son. And then... Uh, and at that, at that cross there, uh, um, God establishes a new covenant. Christ fulfilled the law, and the law, um, uh, the law was able to bring man unto Christ to show man it's his, his wicked state. But Jesus Christ delivers us from the law of sin and death, and now uh, uh, we can enter into a new covenant with him. And he established that thing at that last supper. He, he uh, dedicated it, and it, was, it went into force. Uh, at the cross when Jesus Christ died, uh, and then, uh, and then, thus we, we things launch. We launch into the church age, and there in Acts chapter two, well, more like chapter eleven, I think. Stone Stephen. When Stephen gets stoned, the um, the Holy Spirit is rejected. So you got God the Father rejected as King in Samuel. You got God the Son rejected as King in the Gospels, and then you got the Holy Spirit rejected in in the early book of Acts. And uh, Israel then is blinded, Romans chapter 11. But God's still going to make good on his covenant. Amen. And he's going he's gonna to establish that new covenant with Israel too. And you can read about that, that in Hebrews. And so then, uh, so at the end of that church age, the church gets raptured out, and the tribulation happens that there is a judgment on Israel to win their hearts back. You can read Jeremiah chapter 30 and Isaiah, Ezekiel chapter 20. And several other passages where God's trying to win his people back. There's a judgment there. And meanwhile, up here in heaven, we're getting uh, going through the judgment seat of Christ. And at the end of this judgment on Israel, God establishes that new covenant with Israel. And so there's that covenant. Um, and then you've got the judgment of nations as well here where God judges all those nations, whether or not they helped Israel. Uh, and then we get into the millennium and, and the law is issued. The law shall go forth out of Zion. I didn't talk about some of these details in the past, but the law shall go forth out of Zion. It talks about that in the Old Testament. Uh, the law is going to be reenacted to, um, it, it's going to may, 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 it may be different. It may be different, but certainly the feasts are going to be back. Um, aspects of the law are going to be brought back. Uh, of course, Israel is going to have new heart, new blood, and we're going to be have, we're going to have our new bodies, and so we're going to be priests and kings, and we're going to reign with Christ forever and ever, all that good stuff. But, um, but here we are. Last time we talked about the judgment of nations, and it was dealing with the, the people that survived the tribulation, excluding Israel, because Israel gets taken out in this rapture right here. And um, that's uh, like... Matthew yeah, Matthew 24. Thank you. And then there's Mark 9, maybe? I can't remember. Um, all right. So then here we are, and the next judgment, and at the judgment of nations, you have the goats and the sheep, which are individuals. So the nations are gathered, and the individuals are judged. And those that helped Israel, um, that, that, that uh, treated his brethren, Jesus Christ's brethren, that's Matthew chapter 25, with um, uh, well during the tribulation, they become the sheep and they get everlasting life. And then the people that, um, that, that did not, they get cast into hell. So then um, the next judgment that happens is at the end of the millennium, 
the white throne judgment. And so let's go ahead and jump right into it. The introduction is getting longer and longer. Thankfully, this is ending this week. <laughs> All right, so the white throne judgment. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 10. The Bible says, <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall, all, they shall perish, but thou remainest. They shall all wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. The white throne judgment is described in this passage, and I uh, believe in a couple other passages. Uh, but in this passage, it's described basically as God changing his clothes. Man, what a sight. He's, he's going he's gonna to pull back the veil, and everyone's suddenly going to see God for who he is. Yeah. Right? Uh, Dr. Ruckman used some interesting phrases to describe that. <laughs> We're not going to get into that. <laughs> but God changed, changing his clothes. He's going to pull off the old clothes, and then there's going to be a judgment, and then he's going to make new heavens and new earth. Amen. Right? Uh, so... Um, He's going to peel back that vesture, and, and, uh, and, and no one's going to mock him like they did when they stripped him before going to the cross. Mm. Uh, and um, God's going to show himself to everyone to see, and every knee is going to bow. Philippians hey. chapter 2 is 10 and 11 is going to be fulfilled. Man, what a thing. And, and you know... Um, Turn over to 2 Peter chapter 3. What does that mean when he talks about his, the vesture, he's folding them up and, and changing the vesture? Uh, well, the elements, they're going to melt with a fervent heat. That's what's going to happen. God's going to God, take, take all of creation, and it's just going to be gone. It's going to dissolve. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. Man, this is, this is some phenomenal stuff. Uh, I'm happy to be ending this series here, to be honest, even though there is more topics that I would like to cover eventually. But, um, but uh, you know, i got to leave some stuff for you guys to study, right? <laughs> no, I just, the Lord's leading me in a different direction, so I've got to make a turn here. So verse 10, it says, But the day of the Lord, 2 Peter 3.10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now just so that doesn't throw you off there, the day of the Lord, we know in the scriptures it says, For a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The day of the Lord is the whole millennium, and probably also includes the tribulation. But that's another discussion. It seems to me like it also includes the tribulation. <clears throat> uh, because he talks about the rapture as uh, the, day of, the day of the Lord seems to also include the rapture. So I think you have to include the tribulation in with that day. But anyhow, um, okay, so a day is as a thousand years. And so this millennium period, that entirety, that's, that is the day of the Lord, that whole thing. Okay, so then, so then some things could be talking about stuff that happens at the beginning of the day, and some things could be talking about stuff that happens at the end of the day. You've got to realize that. You've got to make division, right? Make divisions. Okay, so notice there it says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. That is talking about rapture event. Thief in the night is associated with a rapture event. <clears throat> uh... In which the heavens shall pass away, in which, in the day, the heavens are going to pass away. That happens here. So he just jumped a thousand years with a comma. <laughs> Pretty wild stuff. Or sorry, with a semicolon. Uh, in which, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. That's what that vesture changing is going to be. All of the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat. Uh, that's going to be like the biggest explosion that's ever happened, ever. 
and imagine like that man the elements are going to melt Actually, I'm on this page in my notes. I'm kind of ad-libbing right now. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. It's all going to burn up. Amen. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. This is why we shouldn't be too attached with our material possessions. Because right. it's all going to burn. That's why we shouldn't worry too much. We should be good caretakers, good stewards of the earth that God has given us. But we shouldn't worry that much about it because it's all going to burn up. <laughs> uh, okay, seeing then all that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Because that's the only thing that counts. Yeah. Amen. That's all that's going to be left is your works, what you have done for Christ. Right. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. Yeah. And the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. He's like, given that it's all going to burn up, what are you going to do now? Yeah. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. That happens beginning of eternity. Yeah. Or um, the dispensation of the fullness of times. <laughs> Enough on that. All right. So um, uh, the the heavens are going to pass away and melt with a with a with a great noise. Does it say that in this passage? Or did I get that from a different passage? Does it say a great noise? Yeah, with a great noise. In verse ten, it talks about how the element, the heaven, shall pass away with a great noise. It sounds like it's going to be an explosion, like. Kind of like how the atom bomb, you know, but like on a whole different scale. Like all of the atoms are going to go boom. Yeah. <laughs> right? Man, that's wild. Can't even wrap your heads around that one. Imagine, like, and, and all the world's going to behold, we're going to see that. They're going to see, it's going to be this, this, ama this, this massive explosion. Right after God wipes out all of those nations that, that the devil deceived during the millennium and the blood is so running so deep that it's going up to the horse's bridle and uh, he's, so he's just going to wipe out Gog and Magog just in a moment there because it, it happens fast if you read it. He just... Uh, so right after that, then it seems like what's going to happen is suddenly there's going to be this huge explosion and everyone's going to be like just standing on nothing. Yeah. Just going to be like, whoa. I mean, you ever been in like one of those like glass like little you know like you go to like a skyscraper or something like that and they have a little glass like shootout and you can just like see right through the ground and it's just it's kind of terrifying right and you have to like really talk yourself into doing it and believing that the glass is going to hold you <laughs> it's going to be like that but on a whole different scale yep. right because it's going to be all the elements the the, the drop is going to be eternal like it's gonna go, it's just gonna keep going on and on and on. <laughs> and there's gonna be no glass below your feet. Nothing. There's gonna be nothing below your feet. Yeah. And you're probably gonna be like, how am I still alive, right? Because there's gonna be no air or anything either, too. <clears throat> but then you're really gonna see how you're kept by the power of God. You're going to really see it. You're going to really experience it at that point. We, and, um, and you're going to see God there before you. God doesn't need to move anyone, right? The dead can just be wherever they are, wherever they are. And uh, because the scale that we're talking, we're talking a, a God, the God of the universe. Dr. Ruckman likes to draw this picture of the universe and he he puts he puts Christ he draws Christ overlays Christ Christ over that drawing with the head being where the third heaven is and and the the body going down through the entirety of heaven we have a god that is like he's 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 endless he's huge he's not this little like man-sized being that's going to be like a speck of dust in comparison to the universe he is enormous he, we can't even wrap our heads around that there, no one's going to have a problem standing before God, no matter where they're at. Yeah. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> uh, 
Um, so uh, everyone at this white throne judgment, they're going to be standing before God on nothing. We can't even wrap our heads around that, man. That is something. Turn over to Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> Now this this millennium, or this uh, this judgment happens at the end of the millennium. We get that from Revelation chapter twenty, and uh, a little bit earlier in the chapter, verse four is a good place to start. <clears throat> uh, and I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So there you have the tribulation and then the millennium. Okay? So that mark, not receiving the mark, that's referring back to the tribulation. And then um, they reign with Christ a thousand years, so that's talking about the millennium. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So then there's going to be dead people that are going to live again at the end of the thousand years. When does that happen? Uh, look at verse 12. Oh, verse 11. We'll start with verse 11. <clears throat> And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. That's the elements melting with the fervent heat. Yeah. So it's going to melt, there's going to be a great noise, and, and the elements are going to flee. So explosion, rapid expansion, that's the real rapid expansion. <laughs> that's the real Big Bang. They got it on the wrong end. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. There it is. That's that. So we can clearly, just from those two verses, place this white throne judgment at the end of the millennium. You have to be careful with these passages in Revelation because a lot of stuff in Revelation is not chronological. Right. Okay, but these two verses clearly give us this verse here over here, uh, verse five clearly gives us context for verse twelve. Okay, <clears throat> that's when the dead are going to live again. Um, okay, so the white throne judgment, let's hop over to Daniel chapter 7. It's also described in Daniel chapter 7, and we're going to read that passage in Revelation 20 in a minute here. I'm just trying to build up to that. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 7, so this is the passage of the vision uh, with the different beasts, <clears throat> and um, and some, and then there's the, a vision of the coming of the Son of Man in glory, and that's down in verse nine. So, Daniel chapter seven and verse nine, the Bible says, "I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow." He's sitting. You see that? The Ancient of Days is sitting. And the hair of his head was pure, was like pure wool, and his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. So this seems to be that cherub throne, is, that, is the throne that we're talking about here. Yeah. Uh, verse 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Maybe that's the elements melting? I don't know. Maybe there's just fire spewing out of his mouth. I don't know. <clears throat> but that's interesting. Uh, thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. So we got a large group of people ministering to him, and an even larger group of people standing before him. So we've got, see, you see all the pieces falling into place? It lines up exactly with the description in Revelation chapter 20, which we haven't read yet, but we'll get there. Um, this is clearly referring to that white throne judgment. <clears throat> So you got the dead, you got people standing before him, just like we read over in Revelation 20, where the dead, small and great, shall stand, are going to stand before God, right? Okay, so then um, uh, the judgment was set. This We're talking about a judgment. And the books were opened. The only one judgment where there's books, plural, that are opened, and that's Revelation chapter 20, the white throne judgment. 
It has the, the, there's the book of life, and there's the book of life where the names are written down, and then there's the books where the works are recorded. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so, notice there's two groups of people. You've got those that ministered unto him, and you've got those that stood before him. Uh, so, it seems probable that the, the group that's ministered unto him is, is, um, is us. More on that later. And uh, the, the folks that are standing before God are the ones that are being judged. Yeah. Okay? Uh, so, now let's go back to Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> Just trying to bring in as much as much um, context into this, this passage here, because this passage in Revelation 20 is the passage on the white throne judgment. And so I wanted to bring in these other passages, Hebrews chapter 1, Daniel chapter 7, in as context to help us imagine what's going on more clearly, more vividly in our minds. Yeah. Okay, so Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11 is where this passage starts out. The Bible says, And I saw a great white throne. And there's a lot of white described in Daniel chapter 7, so it seems to kind of line up. Um, <clears throat> and I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it. You see, that's the Ancient of Days, seated on a throne, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. That's the elements melting with a fervent heat, with a great noise. Um, and they're fleeing away like kind of like an explosion, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. There's that large group standing before the throne described in Daniel chapter 7. And the books were opened. There's those books, plural. Uh, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. So the, the books, plural, contains the works. And you read down in, um, in verse 15, you'll see the other book contains names. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So we got a book of names, and then we've got books of works. Okay, Verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. This, this, this judgment, there's two aspects of this judgment. There's, there's, your works are tried, and, and there's also whether or not your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. <clears throat> so this is, this is ultimately, this appears to be a works-based judgment. Yeah. All right? Uh, okay. Verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So hell is going to give up all the dead that's in hell. Up until this point, nobody, well, except for the beast and the false prophet, nobody was cast into the lake of fire. I almost slipped up. I got myself, though. <laughs> um, but nobody was cast into the lake of fire up until this point. Now everyone, before that, everyone was cast into hell, and hell is going to spew up all the dead, and those, those dead are going to be judged, and then they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. But there's going to be other groups there. Uh, okay, so verse 17. Oh, hang on now. Revelation 11. Let's turn over to Revelation. Uh, let me make sure I got all the points here that I wanted. Um, yes, we did. So those that have their names in the Lamb's Book of Life, they go into eternity. Those that don't, they go into hell. <clears throat> uh, okay, so Revelation 11. And look at <clears throat> verse 17 and 18. Now, this passage is really interesting and kind of confusing because you, you, you want to put it somewhere else. But if you read carefully... Uh, what these guys are saying is prophetic, all right? So, so these are the four and twenty elders, and they're speaking, okay? Uh, the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God. Okay, that's verse 16. 
and uh, the timing it gives you is the seventh angel sounding. So they're still during the tribulation that they're speaking, right? All right, now, look at verse 17. Look at what they say. Saying, we give thanks, O God, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come. So God is eternal, yep. Because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. See that? That reign doesn't happen until the millennium. But these guys are talking like around here probably. End of the tribulation. Right. So that what they're saying is prophetic. Yeah. See that? Okay. Uh, and the nations were angry and thy wrath is come. And, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. When are the dead going to be judged? White throne judgment. Wow, yeah. See that? Uh, and thou, that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. So there's going to be... <clears throat> Multiple groups of people, saved and lost, not just lost people, because there's going to be prophets and saints. Uh, yeah, and them that fear thy name. They're going to be at the white throne judgment. Yeah. So there's going to be saved people at the white throne judgment. Okay, so we know that there's going to be saved and unsaved. So based on the previous judgments and who was judged and all that kind of stuff and at the various different points, who are going to be, who, who's going to be at this judgment? Okay, and we can put the pieces together. So we know that all of hell is going to cast out all the dead that's in it, and those guys are all going to be judged. So all of the unsaved from the beginning of creation until now, until the white throne judgment, all of the unsaved are going to get judged. Okay. Um, also, there are folks in the tribulation that haven't been accounted for yet because at the judgment of nations, there's, I don't see any reference unless the pre-tribulation rapture is a resurrection. I don't see any reference, reference to a resurrection associated with the judgment of nations. So I believe the dead saints, the dead saved and unsaved from the tribulation also end up at this judgment. Okay. Um, and then also the other group that hasn't been accounted for yet is the millennial saints. They also are going to end up at that judgment. Um, uh, dead or alive, saved or unsaved, like all of the folks from the millennium. <laughs> so, so those are who are going to be at the, who is going to be at this, this judgment. Um, and one other phenomenal, super interesting detail. Turn over to Jude, chapter, well, Jude, verse 6. Chapter one. Yeah, chapter 1. I'm a stupid Bible. Like, I've got this command line Bible tool that I use to, like, inject verses into my notes. And it required that I write Jude 1 to get the verse. And it was complaining when I tried to just do Jude 6. And I was like, man, silly Bible app. Okay, all right, Jude chapter 1, verse 6. <clears throat> Look at this. See, God's really good at keeping people and reserving people for judgment and angels. Jude, chap Jude verse 6. Look at this verse. And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. That's got to be the white throne judgment. Yeah. It has to be the white throne judgment. Because uh, that's like this white throne judgment, it kind of covers everything that wasn't covered before. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and that's when sin is dealt with once and for all, and we go into eternity, and there's going to be all the tears are going to be wiped away. Uh, so... These, there's going to be fallen angels at this judgment. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Turn over to 2 Peter chapter 2. Back a couple of pages. 2 Peter. So you've got to go back before 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and you get to 2 Peter. Chapter 2. Okay. 
and verse 4. Look at this. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to where they're at, hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And when is hell going to spew out all of its contents? Mm -hmm. White throne judgment. Right. All right? So that's pretty clear. Yeah. Uh, and then this is where your mind might get blown, maybe. I don't know. Depends on how well you know your scriptures. But turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter six. And verse one. Remember over in Daniel chapter seven, there's that group that ministered unto the ancient of days. Yeah. Look at this. First Corinthians chapter six, verse one. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints? He's like, what are you guys doing? Taking other Christians to court, basically, right? right? Verse two. Do ye not know? Like this is something obvious that they should know, right? Yeah. <laughs> Lord help us, because some of us don't know this stuff. Uh, do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? We're going to be judging at the white throne judgment. Amen. Let's go. And if the world shall be judged by you, we're going to be helping God, the Ancient of Days, judge the world. Amen. Can you, like, wrap your head around that? Lord. Let's keep going. It gets better. Uh, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? It's like, what are you doing messing around? Like, why can't you figure this thing out? Because you're going to go judge the world yeah. with the ancient of days when all the elements are going to be melt are going to melt with a fervent heat where God's going to change his garments Amen. and uh, all the works of all the all the world from all you know from the beginning of time are going to be set on display and judged you're going to be part of that judgment Amen. the most important judgment maybe like in the whole of scripture and you can't handle this little matter here, right? It's pathetic, right? Look at verse 3. Know ye not that we shall judge angels. Amen. We're going to be judging those angels that are bound uh, in everlasting chains under darkness. Right. We're going to be judging those angels. Man, what a thing. How much more things that pertain to this life. We're going to be judging. We're going to be helping the Lord judge the world. Amen. And we're going to be judging those angels. Yeah. So, so if <clears throat> everything is destroyed, it's, uh, the judgment happens, this judgment happens, then the new heaven and earth must be instantly created. It's, I have to, I think, okay. I think, I mean, it's possible that He's only talking about, like, maybe the third heaven is preserved, but I'm not sure. It seems like all the elements sounds it like, seems like everything. All the elements. So, yeah. yeah. No place for the heavens to be found. Right, um, right. And so there's just the, the, the interesting cross references where Jesus Christ, he goes to prepare a place for you. We know that's talking about New Jerusalem, and right after this, New Jerusalem is going to descend from heaven. And so I guess God must create it right after, instantly, right after. The um, um, right after the this judgment, but I don't know. So we're going to be using word like millennium and talking about it in terms of eternity, but millennium is before eternity. Right. So the, this white throne judgment is like that crossover point where right. at the end of the millennium, all of the elements are melted with a fervent heat, and then God recreates everything for eternity. Right. Okay. So. Um, so that's the, that's the main kind of bullet points of the white throne judgment. Amen. Does that, all of this making sense so far? Yes, sir. All right, so now there's this really interesting passage I wanted to go to by way of conclusion to end this thing. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was reading this thing and just mind-blowing, like this is some phenomenal, this is some amazing stuff. There is a picture of the white throne judgment in Zechariah. So turn to Zechariah chapter 3. <laughs> Zechariah chapter 3. <clears throat> Let 
Look at this. <sighs> okay. So Zechariah chapter 3, and this is so right, right before Matthew, go back, and you'll see Malachi, and then, and then right before Malachi, you got Zechariah. They're small books, so it's really easy to miss them. <laughs> Uh, all right, so Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 1 says, And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. Now, this is not the Joshua of the book of Joshua. This is a different Joshua. Okay. So, and he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. Now, if you know your Bible, the angel of the Lord, that is a, that is a pre-incarnate um, appearance of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Okay. So, that is not an angel. That is Jesus Christ. All right, so, okay, Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. So from the perspective of Joshua, you have got, you have got Jesus Christ there on the left and Satan on the right. From the perspective of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is on the right, and Satan is on the left. Hard to, a little confusing. <laughs> all right, <laughs> okay, all right. Um, and, uh, okay, so let's keep going here. Verse 2, and the Lord said unto Satan, oh, and by the way, um, both... The angel of the Lord, both Jesus Christ and Satan, are standing. Okay? They're standing. Okay. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee. Now, that, that's interesting right there. So that's Jesus Christ saying, God the Father rebuke thee. That's what he's saying. Yeah. All right. So the Lord, Jesus Christ, said unto Satan, The Lord, God the Father, uh, rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem, that's God the Father, because Israel is his people, right? Uh, rebuke thee. Is not this a, a brand plucked out of the fire? Like, basically, you know, Joshua is so fresh, barely missed hell by the skin of his teeth, you can still smell the smoke on his garments. Like, that's what we're talking about here, a fire brand pulled right out of the fire. Um, and now look at the description of this Joshua, verse 3. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. You know what it says over in Isaiah? It says, for all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Yeah, yeah. yeah your works are never going to measure up. That's Amen. always true. It doesn't matter where you're at in Scripture. Your works are always going to be filthy That's rags right. before God. Even though there's these systems like in the Old Testament where it seems like everything's work, works-based, their works are still never going to measure up. They're still never going to get to heaven on their own works. They are only going to get to heaven by the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we see that here, right, in this passage. Verse 4, And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And he, um, and he said, And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. Man. And I said, let them set a fair miter upon his head. That's a crown. So, he, so, so this Joshua, this, uh, you know, this, uh, this saint, you know, that, that tried his best to serve God and had faith, and God saw that faith. And, 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 um, and so Jesus Christ advocated for him before the Lord and said, and, and told the Lord to rebuke Satan and all of his accusations because this man demonstrated faith by his works, even though his works are never going to measure up to heaven. So we need to change those garments, throw those works out, and give him the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ and put a crown upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. Man. What a sight. Yeah. So, so this, does this mean Jerusalem is going to make it to the second? No, it's just, just describing who God is. <clears throat> I'm talking about, okay, you talked about a brand plucked out of the fire. Yes. So the idea is you have this person being judged that, um, 
uh, not from the church age, right, where he receives his garments before, like he receives his garment, he's already dressed in white robes. We're talking about someone like in the millennium maybe who followed the law to the best of his ability and had faith in Jesus Christ and was trying to do his best to do right, but ultimately his best is still not enough, and so he comes before the throne at this judgment with filthy robes on, and, and, and so Jesus Christ advocates for him before God the Father and says, and, and where, whereas, whereas um, Satan is, is standing and accusing. I think this is what's going to happen at the white throne judgment, is you're going to have God the Father seated on that white throne and Jesus Christ standing on his right hand and Satan standing on his left hand, on the left hand. And Satan, who is the accuser of our brethren the, over there in Revelation, is going to be making accusations. He's going to say, this guy does not deserve to go to heaven because of this and this and this. And then Jesus Christ is going to say, no, this guy had faith. And this this guy, um, uh, this guy, we should, we we need to give this guy a change of garments, and then they 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 replace those those filthy rags with uh, some white robes and a crown on his head, and he receives eternal life and gets saved there at that judgment. I think this is this is what's going to be happening there at that white throne judgment, and I see some confusion and some some questions. <laughs> um, <clears throat> But man, what a sight. So, okay, what's your question? Well, because wasn't Satan in the Yes, so that is the question. Uh, <laughs> that is definitely a very good question. So let me, let me show you, let me just show you, because that's the main issue with this stance. But this seems to fit the white throne judgment very well otherwise. Um, so if you go to Daniel chapter 7, let's just, let's just do my best to clear that up. <laughs> Okay, but again, this is the big question. Is this the proper interpretation? I don't know, but man, it sure makes for some good preaching. <laughs> uh, I think it's the right interpretation, though. So Daniel chapter 7. Okay, now um, <clears throat> notice there, okay, so in verses 9 and 10, we read that earlier. That's very clearly the white throne judgment. And then in verse 11, it says, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. That's the Antichrist. Um, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to burning flame. That seems like maybe he is speaking at this judgment before he's actually cast into the lake of fire. And so maybe the description there in Revelation chapter 20 where it seems like he's cast into the lake of fire before the judgment is at, is is not in the um, is not in a chronological order. Again, this may be wrong, but um, but Jesus. But we know we know all over Scripture um, that um, uh, Jesus Christ is described as an advocate in First John chapter two and verse one. He's the advocate, so that means he's the defense attorney. And we know that in Revelation chapter twelve, verse 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 ten, Satan is the accuser, um, so he's the prosecuting attorney. And there's going to be this big judgment, and. Um, Joshua the high priest represents someone being judged and it's a works based it's obviously there's a works element there because he's coming before God with his righteousness which is nothing more than filthy rags and we know the white throne judgment is a works based judgment um, and then um, and, uh, and it seems like Satan is making accusations because Jesus Christ says the Lord rebuke thee O Satan right it doesn't record what Satan says here the horn, yeah, horn's the Antichrist. Um, th I'm missing the verse here, but there's a verse that describes, well, it is Satan, but Satan as a man. Okay, so Jesus Christ as a man is advocating, and Satan as a man advocate, um, is defense attorney. Or, okay, so, um, and I, I don't have the cross-reference in my notes. Um, Dr. Ruckman talks about it in his Revelations commentary, and, it, and he talks about it in his, I think in his Daniel commentary. If not one, then the other. Maybe both. <laughs> um, but if you look at Daniel chapter 7, around verse uh, 9, 9 to 11, um, it's, it's talked about there. And then also Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 to 14, it's talked about there as well. 
in, in his commentary. But man, I thought that was so interesting. Um, whew, man. Uh, and that is some good preaching right there. Praise God. Like you've realized the implications of that. You're going to, someone who, someone, someone who ends up at this judgment is going to be facing an accuser that knows everything that they've done. Satan knows you better than you know yourself. And man, if you haven't put your faith in Christ, you have absolutely, you've got nothing. That's right. You've got nothing, no leg to stand on. So then, um, so then at this white throne judgment, sin is dealt with once and for all, and all tears are wiped away. Turn over to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1, the Bible says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. That sea is referring to that great deep that divided heaven from the rest of creation. That's what that's referring to. And, um, and, so, uh, and then in verse 2, you have a new Jerusalem coming down. And then look at verse 4. Verse 4, it says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Amen. Amen. Neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. God's right. going to deal with sin once and for all at this white throne judgment. Amen. And he's, so those elements are going to melt with a fervent heat, and everything's going to be burned up, and then God's going to judge, and we're going to help him judge everything, all, all of the world and the fallen angels. And then that devil, if I, my interpretation of Daniel chapter 7 is correct, is going to be cast into the lake of fire at the end of all of that and then the the new heavens and the new earth are going to be created and we're going to go into eternity and all tears are going to be wiped away and we're going to remember sin sin's going to be remembered no more no one's ever going to remember the sin anymore there because there's a massive remembrance of sin made right here at that white throne judgment because the works are going to be tried um, and then the rest of eternity is going to be John 17, 3, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Imagine, uh, imagine spending your eternity getting to know the um, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, unknowable God, Jesus Christ. That, that's going to be our eternity. What a thing. <laughs> Man, what a thing. Uh, we're going to spend uh, the rest of eternity getting to know the Savior that died, bled and died for us. And uh, we're going to be searching out the depth of the riches, of both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Right. That's Romans 11.33. And the rest of eternity for the unsaved is going to be just like what it says in Revelation 14.11. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they shall have no rest day nor night. If nothing else in the Bible wakes you up, this should wake you up. <laughs> this, this is something like this. God's gonna gonna set the record straight one day, Amen. and you better get get on the right side today, because right. once you're there, your opportunities are gone. That's right. All right. So that is is what I've got on the the white throne judgment concludes my series here for God's method for Bible study. This again, white throne judgment, this marks a, a great division in scripture where time ends and eternity begins, where sin is dealt with once and for all. And you can go read about Revelation 21 and Revelation 22 if you want to get a better idea of what's going on in eternity. Amen. Um, some of the topics that we covered uh, throughout this series, this is 11 parts is <laughs> to, to get all this stuff um, in. As we talked about the command to rightly divide, we talked about what rightly dividing is, identifying differences, asking the question who and when, and making divisions. And, um, um, 
and how to do how to how to properly make those divisions by realizing oh this is talking to Israel this is talking to the church this is about the Gentiles uh, this is a future judgment this is uh, uh, you know this judgment is different than this judgment so we got to divide you know um, <clears throat> this testament is different than this testament this covenant is different than this covenant you know etc. We talked about the Old and New Testaments. We talked about the First and Second Advents. We talked about the, 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 the raptures, the two, rapture of the church, rapture of Israel, the end of the tribulation, the, the resurrections. You've got Jesus Christ and Old Testament saints. You've got the resurrection of the church. And then um, uh, there's a resurrection of Israel during the tribulation. And there's... Um, the, the second, the second resurrection, the resurrection of damnation, that happens there with the white throne judgment. Um, <clears throat> talked about. Uh, from all of that, I think we have a pretty good understanding of the outline of Scripture and where these different divisions are, and where these key points are. You might even have the chapters memorized: Genesis chapter three, Genesis chapter six. 11, 12, <laughs> Exodus 19, the Gospels. <laughs> Anyways. Um, <laughs> uh, there are a couple topics that I didn't get to cover that I would like to cover eventually, but the Lord had uh, seems to have uh, had other plans, and so we're going to go ahead and set this aside for a while and, and move on to other things. But I did want to talk about the kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of God. Um, and then I also wanted to talk about some personal divisions, more spiritual type stuff, like lost, saved and lost, and you know, godly separation, all that kind of stuff. Because our divisions extend out from just the inside the Bible and doctrine. There's also spiritual divisions that have to be made, standing versus state, um, etc. But anyhow, we can get to that stuff as the Lord gives liberty down the road. But for, the, for now, that concludes my series on rightly dividing the scriptures. Uh, any questions on any of that stuff? Or well, I think we, I'm pretty happy with how that turned out. Um, okay, all right. Well, I'm just about on time. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your word, Lord. And I just pray that this, this was a help to someone, Lord. And, um, and uh, I pray you be with us for this uh, fellowship hour, Lord. And... Um, you put your, bless the food to our bodies, Lord, and uh, thank you for it, Lord, and thank you for your provisions, Lord. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.